tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por acudir a, a esta nueva convocatoria del programa Masterclass. Esta tarde contamos con la presencia de una invitada muy especial para el Instituto Autor. Eh, es la profesora Jane Kingsburg de la Universidad de Columbia, experta en propiedad intelectual, por supuesto, una de las más importantes expertas a nivel internacional, miembro del Consejo Editorial y asesor del Instituto de Derecho de Autor. Y además, eh, como decía, una persona muy querida por el Instituto. Ella fue la conferenciante que inauguró este programa de conferencias, Masterclass, en, en junio de 2011 ya. Y desde entonces no ha faltado a la cita siempre que, que la hemos llamado. Muchas gracias, Jane. Bienvenida otra vez a Madrid. Pero además del orgullo y de la alegría de tener aquí a, a Jane de nuevo, hoy tenemos también el honor de contar con el representante de, de la Embajada de los Estados Unidos, el ministro consejero, Chris Urs, muchísimas gracias por, por acudir aquí por, a nuestra invitación y por hacer la presentación de Jane Ginsburg eh, y por quedarte también a, a moderar el, el debate que seguirá a continuación. Así que bueno, pues eh, ante la audiencia y las expectativas despertadas eh, con esta conferencia y con, y con la presencia de la embajada, no os entretengo más. Le doy la palabra al señor Urs. Muchas gracias. Adriana, thanks very much uh, for those uh, for that introduction. Um, I'd really like to thank um, the WIPO and the Instituto Autor for inviting me to participate here uh, this evening. Uh, as you know, uh, our ambassador is from uh, the content industry. He's a former vice president at, at HBO, um, and he has a great interest in intellectual property. Uh, he's participated in a number of conferences uh, similar to this. He's published an editorial. Uh, promoting strong uh, intellectual property rights here in Spain uh, and highlighting the importance of protecting intellectual property rights. I mean, he's corresponded regularly with the government of Spain, uh, uh, with the private sector, and with associations like the Instituto de Autor um, in order to improve intellectual property rights protection uh, and legislation here in Spain. Uh, you know, uh, we feel uh, that intellectual property rights are really the underpinning of the modern economy uh, in the United States today. If we look at, uh, if we look at the United States economy, um, we ha for example, if we look back at uh, a study done by um, Robert Solo, who was a Nobel Prize winner uh, in 1987 uh, for, in economics, uh, he studied the U.S. economy's performance between 1909 and 1949, and he found that fully 80% of the economic growth that occurred between 1909 and 1949 was attributable to innovation. So ordinarily, you know, you'd look at and you'd say, well, capital uh, will contribute a certain amount, growth in capital or growth in, in, uh, in, um, in labor uh, and, uh, or additional land brought into cultivation or whatever it may be. But fully 80% of the increase in the growth in the United States between 1909 and 1949 was attributable to innovation. So, uh, so intellectual property, innovation, the knowledge economy is an enormously important thing. Um, uh, so, and, and for that reason, improving the inter inter international, intellectual rather, property environment is a very important goal for the U.S. Embassy uh, here in Spain. I'm delighted that we have one of America's preeminent intellectual property rights scholars here to support these efforts, um, Jane Ginsburg is the Morton L. Janklau uh, Professor of Literary and Artistic Property Law uh, at the Columbia University School of Law. She teaches legal methods, copyright law, and trademarks law. Uh, and she's the author and or co-author of case books on all three subjects. She's the co-author of Copyright Concepts and Insights, uh, published in 2012, and International Copyright and Neighboring Rights, The Berne Convention and Beyond, which was published in 2006. Uh, other books authored by Professor Ginsburg, including several volumes on domestic and international copyright and trademark law. The topic of tonight's discussion is the U.S. Supreme Court's Aereo decision and the making available right. The making available right was introduced uh, on the international level by the 1996 uh, WIPO Internet Treaties uh, in order to cover the making available of works to the public in such a way that members of the public may access these works from a place and time individually chosen by them. The right's been interpreted uh, to cover the placement of work on the internet where it can be accessed by individual members of the public. 
When the United States implemented the WIPO uh, Internet Treaties and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in 1998, it did not include an explicit making available right, uh, as both Congress and the administration concluded that the relevant elements were encompassed uh, in, existing, in the existing scope of U.S. laws regarding copyright, such as public performance and reproduction and distribution rights, which apply to digital transmissions as well as to the distribution of physical copies. Since the DCMA was implemented, a number of U.S. courts have addressed the issue uh, and, and the making available right specifically. While many concluded that the distribution right incorporates the concept of making available uh, reflected in the WIPO treaties, other courts have disagreed, uh, and the Arrow case is an important case in providing a degree of clarity as far as U.S. law on this topic. But as you can see, this all gets very complicated very quickly, and I'm not the expert on this. Uh, Jane is the expert on this, so I think it's the time to uh, invite the real uh, specialist to the microphone to discuss these matters. We're delighted to have Jane with us here today, this evening. Please uh, join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you, Instituto Autor, for inviting me back. It is always a pleasure to be here. And I, I regret not having sufficient capability in Castellano to give the lecture in uh, Spanish, but during the question and answer period afterwards, um, please feel free to ask questions in Spanish and uh, I will reply in either Spanish or English, but my comprehension is a lot better than my ability to, uh, to lecture in Spanish. So we will proceed uh, in English. Uh, as uh, the, uh, uh, Chris Urs's uh, uh, introduction effectively was a very nice summary of the, uh, of the first part of this talk, but I will go into a little more detail. So the U United States, uh, the, the question before us is whether the United States is actually implementing its international obligations, because I, I might say a little bit puckishly that uh, it's very nice that the United States wants Spain to uh, live up to its obligations, but it would be nice if the United States lived up to its obligations as well. So part of our inquiry today is the extent to which the United States uh, uh, is uh, abiding by the obligations that it signed on to in uh, 1996 with the WIPO Copyright Treaty. Now, uh, Chris Erst read to you the text of the treaty, so here it is before you, and the relevant, uh, most relevant portion is in red, that the members of the public may access works of authorship from a place and at a time individually chosen by them. This text in 1996, uh, known as the part of the WIPO Internet Treaties, was intended to uh, ensure that copyright law uh, continued to work on the Internet. So whether or not this text introduces a new right or simply clarifies an old right, the uh, purpose of the text was to ensure that on-demand delivery of works of authorship, whether by downloading or by streaming, would be covered by the international obligation. Uh, now, just what the making available right means has encountered some controversy. The question being whether the making available right extends only to the actual delivery of the content or whether it covers the offer to deliver the content. Now, I think if one goes back to the text, you will see that the way the obligation is phrased, the members of the public may access these works. This is potential access. So uh, they think the text itself makes clear that the making available right covers the offer of content as well as the actual provision of content. And the European Court of Justice agreed uh, 
quite explicitly last year in the Svensson case, which I assume many of you are familiar with because it's the case on hyperlinking in which the uh, European Court of Justice held that providing links to content lawfully made available without restriction, restrictions uh, is a communication but not to a new public and therefore the hyperlinking which one might consider as a form of secondary transmission uh, is, uh, does not require the authorization of the uh, authors or owners of the linked to content. But before the ECJ discussed the new application of the new public concept, the first question was whether or not the providing a, a link is a form of communication to the public, whether it is making the work available. And in the course of that analysis, the ECJ made quite clear that the making available right is not limited to the actual delivery of content, but also covers the offering of that content. So in such a way that the persons forming that public may access it irrespective of whether they avail themselves of that opportunity. So it suffices to uh, inform the public that the material is available for access. It is not necessary to prove that any member of the public actually accessed the material. Now, in the United States, as Chris Harris indicated, we don't have a making available right in those words. Rather, the uh, United States took the position, which was also endorsed during the time of the negotiation of the WIPO treaty, that the making available right could be implemented by a variety of means. They could, it could be implemented by having a verbatim transposition of Article 8, which is what the EU did in the Information Society Directive of 2001, or it would be possible to uh, cover the same uh, economic concerns through a combination of uh, other exclusive rights under copyright in, which in the case of the United States, the combination of the public performance right and the distribution right would uh, serve as the practical equivalent of the making available right because in the United States, unlike the European Union, the distribution right is not limited to physical copies but also covers digital copies. And this approach was dubbed the umbrella solution because the making available right can be implemented by a variety of means. The question, however, is whether, at least for the United States, the umbrella has broken. Uh, and this is a little bit cynical to say that there are two sources of the problem. One is Congress and the other is the courts. Uh, but in effect, there may be some shortcomings in the text of the Copyright Act uh, and more significantly shortcomings in the way the courts have interpreted the Copyright Act. So let's look at the text of the Copyright Act. In uh, the 1976 uh, Act, provides for a variety of exclusive rights, and the third of these is the right to distribute the work in copies. And the question uh, arose in litigations in the United States whether the copy has to be a material copy or whether it can be a dematerialized digital copy. The argument was that if the statute refers to distribution by sale or other transfer of ownership, that implies that the uh, person effecting the distribution by transferring ownership of a copy necessarily divests him or herself of ownership of a copy. In other words, uh, I'm going to take Manuel de Santis' De Santis's business card, and if I distribute this copy, if I transfer ownership of the copy to Adriana, I do not have the copy anymore. She, I've transferred ownership of the copy, and by in so doing, I have divested myself of ownership of that copy. So the argument was that uh, transfer of ownership implies physical copies only. 
Uh, that in interpretation has in fact been rejected by the courts. The courts have taken the position that transfer of ownership does not require a divestiture of the distributor's ownership. What counts is to constitute new ownership uh, with the recipient. So that if I, uh, if instead of giving a physical copy of Manuel's card to Adriana, uh, I have a, a file that uh, has the same information and I email that file to Adriana, I still have the file because in the digital world, when you send something, it doesn't disappear from, your, from the source computer unless you make a specific effort to make it disappear. Otherwise, it doesn't disappear. But now Adriana has a copy. So in effect, where there was one copy, now there are two copies. And I have created ownership of a copy in Adriana's computer. So the courts have said that what counts is the creation of ownership of a copy in the computer of the recipient. And that is consistent uh, with uh, terminology in the computer world. The expression file transfer protocol means that you are sent transferring, you're sending a file to somebody, uh, but you have not divested yourself of the file that you quote transfer. So transfer implies simply creating a copy in somebody else's computer. And there are also other places in the US Copyright Act which refer to digital yeah. delivery. And there, it's clear that that, that that refers to sending a file to somebody and does not require that the sender uh, uh, be deprived of, uh, of a source copy. So, the courts have cover, have considered that distribution, the distribution right, can cover digital delivery. So to that extent, the distribution right uh, uh, gets us part of the way to the making available right. However, uh, the, the problem is whether the distribution right implies that there has been a distribution, or does it also cover the offer? to distribute a copy. So when I send the file to Adriana, that is a distribution. But if I simply say to Adriana, come into my computer on my peer-to-peer -peer network and make a copy from my sharing file, is that a distribution if I have offered her the possibility to make a copy, but I, I don't know uh, if she has actually made a copy. So that's the, the, the issue of whether or not the distribution right covers not only actual distributions, but an offer to, trans, to uh, distribute by digital transmission. And as Chris Earth said, uh, the case law in the United States is very unclear. We have dis decisions that go in many different directions. So we have decisions all from first level courts. We do not have a decision from an appellate court. But we have decisions that, uh, that say yes, the distribution right covers offers to distribute. We have decisions that say the, that the distribution right requires an actual distribution, but we can presume that the distribution occurred if the person offering the content has done everything to make the work available and the only thing remaining to be done is for the recipient to click on a button to effect the distribution. Um, and we, that's the second uh, of, the dis of the decisions um, on the slide. And then the third decision, uh, which is the most troublesome from the point of view of United States compliance with international obligations, uh, we have a court that has said that uh, the, there has to be an actual distribution and the occurrence of that actual delivery has to be proved by the author or copyright owner. So that decision is, I think, inconsistent with uh, our international obligations. Uh, but we have, at the moment, no definitive judicial interpretation. So I think that it is fair to say that it is unclear whether the United States is fully uh, implementing its obligation 
uh, under the making available right under the distribution prong of the umbrella so solution. I can't say that we are definitely not uh, implementing, but I can't say that we are definitely are until such time as we have more authoritative judicial interpretation. The U.S. government, the uh, uh, Patent and Trademark Office uh, in the Department of Commerce and the Copyright Office have all said that the better interpretation is the interpretation of those courts who have encompassed the offer to deliver, but uh, we still don't have a more definitive ruling than that. The other piece of the umbrella solution, the other prong, if, if you will, is the public performance right. The distribution right would cover downloading, and so it covers actual downloading. We don't know if it covers offers to make it possible for members of the public to download. Uh, but what about streaming? That comes under the public performance right. And the public performance right comes in two parts. One is what is a performance, and the other is what is public. And the Copyright Act helpfully provides definitions of public, uh, of, perf of to perform and uh, public, uh, publicly, to perform publicly. So to perform, um, we are told, uh, this is the definition, you have it uh, uh, on the slide, and the essential aspect of to perform uh, requires that the work is being rendered as it is being communicated. So a performance of a work means that the work is playing uh, as it is as, as it is being communicated. If we are talking about communication by transmission, we're talking about, say, you turn on the radio and you are hearing the music in real time. Uh, uh, streaming, webcasting, you are hearing the music in uh, just about real time. As opposed to the delivery of a file, that you will then listen to, to on your device. But when it is delivered to your device, it is not playing. It's only playing after the uh, file is received on your device. Well, that, according to the United States case law, is not a public performance, where that's in the realm of distribution of a copy, because to perform means that the work is playing as it is being communicated, as opposed to a two-step process where it's sent to you and then you play it. Uh, as we will see, this may create some problems when it comes to the United States implementation of its obligation. The other part of the public performance right is the uh, public part. And uh, since we are talking about public performance by transmission, the relevant portion of the definition you have in red to, uh, to transmit uh, a performance of the work. So it's not to transmit a copy of the work, it's to transmit a performance of the work by means of any device or process. So Congress in 1976 was trying to anticipate the future and to write a law that would be technologically neutral so that it would cover future modes of transmission, whether the members of the public capable of receiving the performance or display receive it in the same place or separate places and at the same time or at different times. And that last part, receive it at different times, was Congress's anticipation as early as 1976 of uh, uh, video on demand, audio on demand, I think it, they're mostly thinking about video on demand and pay-per-view. And the uh, cr crucial feature of on demand is that the uh, rather than broadcasting, in which the work is sent out to the public simultaneously, on demand is delivery to the members of the public at such time as the members of the public may request it. So the language of the statute would cover all kinds of transmissions on demand. So that sounds like it ought to be good enough to cover the United States obligation of, on the making available right, at least on the streaming side of, uh, the, of, of the communications. Um, but 
we have some doubts. There's the, the question of whether, uh, just as we saw there was some problem with the distribution right, do you have to have an actual distribution uh, or will it cover an offer to distribute? The, the text is a little ambiguous as to whether uh, a public performance a, a has to be one that is happening or if it's enough to offer to publicly perform the work. The text, uh, sorry, go back. The, t the text uh, looks like it could cover the offer, but the problem is that if to perform means that the performance is happening in real time, does that imply that the, uh, that the statute only, uh, only kicks in when there is a real time delivery? So that's, that is an ambiguity in the scope of the statute. Now, things, things have been, were made much worse uh, n by the courts. So we've got some ambiguities in the statute, but the real problems arose after a decision in 2008 by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals called Cartoon Network uh, against Cablevision. And that was a case in which the, uh, the producers of television programming argued that a service provided by Cablevision, which is a cable uh, transmission operation, uh, was in effect a form of video on demand and should be licensed separately uh, by the copyright owners. What Cablevision said was that uh, their service, which enabled their subscribers to uh, designate programs in the program guide that the subscribers were not uh, available to watch at the time of the initial tr retransmission, uh, could be copied by Cablevision, stored on Cablevision's server, and then delivered to members of the public at the convenience of the members of the public. Now, if that sounds familiar, it sounds like um, uh, like video tape recording. The difference, however, is that the recording is not happening in the homes of the subscribers. It's happening in the cloud on the server of Cablevision. And the percul per peculiarity of the Cablevision service was that uh, it took its server and divided it into as many tiny storage areas as it had subscribers. So anytime a subscriber said, I want to watch a particular program at a different time, Cablevision would copy the program and then make as many copies as subscribers had requested. So rather than just having one centralized copy, which would then be the source for multiple on-demand transmissions, Cablevision created this extraordinarily Baroque system where every subscriber had a little piece of the computer, the cloud, um, and the uh, program was copied as many times as there were subscribers, and then each time a subscriber asked for transmission of the program, the subscriber's own copy would be the unique source of the transmission so that uh, no two members of the public would wa watch a transmission deriving from the same source copy. And the, so Cablevision said, this is just like our subscribers each having their own recording device in the sky. So you have to think of this not as video on demand, but rather as a form of uh, of home recording, only home is now extended to the cloud. And the key piece of this uh, analysis, which the S Second Circuit bought, was that if you have a, an individualized source copy so that only one member of the public can receive a transmission from that copy, then that is no longer to the public because only one person can receive a transmission from that copy. Well, Cablevision was a very controversial decision because it didn't take terribly much imagination or technological know-how to realize that uh, this 
system of creating private uh, individualized source copies could propagate to other services. Uh, and in fact, the Aereo case uh, is the result of other entrepreneurs realizing that if you could uh, take if you could create as many source copies as there are subscribers if there's no uh, per public performance in that instance then you have a system for retransmitting copyrighted works that's copyright free so that's how we got area what you what you see in front of you um, are individualized antennas Aereo uh, was a service that uh, made available to its subscribers television programming. It took over the air signals and digitized the, si the signals and then retransmitted the signals to its subscribers. So the value added here is that it becomes possible to watch television programming on any digital device. So you can watch it on your smartphone, you can watch it on your tablet, you can watch it on your portable um, com computer, your laptop, or you can watch it on, on your desktop. So that's, uh, and plus you get a digital quality signal rather than a broadcast signal, which in major urban areas is often a very bad signal because of, of all the interference. And uh, following the Cablevision roadmap, every subscriber got an antenna. Those antennas, as you saw from the first slide, are about the size of a um, uh, of a of a ten cent piece, so they're they're very small. Right? They're they're just the the end of your thumb size. So it is possible to uh, have fifty thousand of these little antennas uh, corresponding to fifty thousand subscribers, and so each subscriber is in theory tuning in to the television signal. The um, then the signal is routed to. Uh, Aereo's computers to be digitized and then stored in those individualized storage boxes so that uh, there is one copy per user uh, and uh, that the this simply follows on from the Cablevision decision and Aereo when it was sued by the television producers uh, argued that they what they were doing wasn't a public performance because they had split the signal into as many subscribers uh, as uh, uh, into as many um, signals pulled down and then stored and then sent out as there were subscribers. So it was always one subscriber to one source copy to one uh, antenna. Therefore, no public performance. Well, um, the Supreme Court reversed. The, the Supreme Court uh, held that uh, this was a public performance. It was not a unanimous dis decision, but it was six to three, good enough. Uh, and the Supreme Court confronted two questions. The first question is, who is performing? And then the second question was, is that performance public? The Second Circuit had not confronted the question of whether cable, uh, cable excuse me, Aereo performed because it concluded that regardless of who performed, it wasn't public, so there was no violation of the act. Uh, but the Supreme Court was obliged to answer the upfront question, who performs? Aereo's defense was, we just provide equipment. We do not choose which programming to, to tune into. We do not uh, select uh, when to watch the programming, although the principal uh, feature of Aereo was to watch television uh, more or less live. Uh, and so they argued, we're, we just provide equipment that in, in order to uh, be engaged in the act of performance, the uh, entity accused of engaging in a public performance has to have uh, exercised some specific volition as to the content that is being performed. 
uh, and Aereo got that from the Cablevision decision as well. Supreme Court disagrees. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court says that Aereo is very similar to a cable retransmission operation, only instead of capturing the signals and sending it through wires to the public, that's cable, it, uh, Aereo captures the signals and then sends it out digitally over the internet to the public. The and that because Aereo so much resembles uh, cable uh, uh, operations, it's not possible to argue that they're merely providing equipment because uh, the Supreme Court had in the 1970s in two decisions had held that cable retransmission operators were not performing the works, they were only providing equipment, but when Congress revised the Copyright Act in 1976, Congress explicitly disapproved of that reasoning and said that cable operators are performing. They're not just providing equipment. So if cable operators are performing, the nature of Aereo's operations are not so different, so they're performing. The, the dissent argued that Aereo wasn't performing, that it should be considered more like a, uh, an equipment provider because Aereo did not exercise specific volition as to which programming was going to be communicated, but that's a dissent. So that doesn't, it's intellectually interesting, it doesn't count for the question of whether the United States is implementing the making available right. Uh, for if, Aereo is performing. The next question is, is Aereo performing publicly? Now, the problem with the Second Circuit's interpretation was that one-to-one -one correspondence, that if you, if there is, uh, if a transmission from one, uh, that is received by one subscriber derives from the subscriber's own copy, then that transmission is not to the public. And the Supreme Court says you've misinterpreted the text of the statute. The statute ta uh, addresses a performance of the work. The statute doesn't ask, is a particular transmission capable of being received by multiple persons? The question is whether the performance of the work is capable of being received by multiple persons. Uh, and therefore, and, and yes, if, uh, if Aereo was transmitting the same work by splitting it up into 50,000 transmissions, but it's still the same work. So yes, that is a, uh, a public performance. Uh, and this may sound somewhat familiar because here in the EU, the TV catch-up case was a similar kind of operation with, uh, and it was argued that the individualized transmissions were made those transmissions not public. And the ECJ says, no, you look at the, in the aggregate, is the, is the work being transmitted? Yes. And then the next question is, who is it being transmitted to? Is it being transmitted to the public? Uh, and both the Supreme Court and the ECJ in the TV catch-up case considered that the public should be uh, deemed to be a large number of persons who are unrelated and unknown to each other. So that, dis that distinguishes a family and its circle of social acquaintance, or a family circle. So if uh, the, the work is being transmitted to lots of people, that is uh, a public performance. Well, what about the problem that we started with, which is Aereo is actually transmitting, and no problem proving that Aereo is actually transmitting, but Aereo is also offering to transmit the content. So is the offering part also uh, a, um, uh, a public performance? And this is, this is potentially problematic because if offering uh, is not uh, a public performance, then uh, in order to establish that the communication is going out to a large number of people unrelated to each other, you would have to wait 
for the transmissions to actually happen and then count how many people. It's an undefined large number, but you can imagine the same <laughs> clever people who came up with Aereo and came up with Cablevision can come up with some other clever designs. For example, let's suppose that um, 100 people is the threshold for a large number of people. If it is necessary for the transmissions actually to have occurred, then you can design your business model so that you have no more than 99 potential subscribers. And so long as you don't cross that threshold of 100 actual transmissions, then you haven't, in, you haven't made a public performance. You then create another entity which will communicate the work to another 99 people, and you create another entity which will com communicate the work to another 99 people. So you never actually communicate the work to more than, uh, to whatever our requisite number of large persons. That doesn't make any sense at all. So for the interpretation of the act to make sense, I think it is necessary to say that the offer is going to a large number of people. It doesn't matter how many people actually accept that offer. Because if you require actual acceptance, then you are inviting new uh, uh, abuse, I would say abusive uh, bus business models. Uh, now, in the Aereo case, it, it was controversial because even if some might think that what Aereo was doing was simply uh, uh, the copyright equil equivalent of tax avoidance, creating this very baroque structure to uh, avoid uh, being held liable under the public performance right, uh, there was a countervailing consideration, which is if the Supreme Court says that Aereo is engaged in public performance, what happens to the cloud computing industry? Because uh, Aereo is uh, built on individualized storage and communication of works. Well, uh, does it therefore follow that all individualized storage and communication of works is potentially a public performance? Suppose that you have a service like Dropbox, um, in which members of the public are posting content to their storage boxes in the cloud. Now suppose that some large members, a number of members of the public, happen to be storing the same work, the same third-party copyrighted work. That would mean that uh, Dropbox uh, is actually or potentially communicating the same work to multiple members of the public. And that would be a very bad result. So the Supreme Court distinguished services like Dropbox. Uh, and it distinguished it on the theory that, the, that when the members of the public post the content to the, their storage boxes, they have some pre-existing possessory relationship with the copy of the content that they have posted. This is very different from um, services like uh, Aereo, where Aereo is proposing the content to the members of the public. Aereo is initiating the delivery of the content to members of the public. So the Supreme Court says, what are people paying for? Are they paying to store their stuff, Dropbox? Well, OK, that's not a public performance. Uh, are they paying to get transmissions of television programming? Aereo, yes, that is a public performance. This does not, however, tell us where in between Dropbox and Aereo, these kind of intermediary services, which might be some combination of uh, delivery of the content, um, storage, and subsequent communication of the content, uh, where whether that uh, is a um, uh, is also a public.
performance. As to Dropbox, as this slide indicates, Dropbox probably could convincingly say that it is only providing equipment because they don't initiate the storage of the programming. They are not simply a retransmission service passing through third-party programming. But we don't know about those intermediary services of which uh, Cablevision is an example. The Supreme Court said that it was not going to decide the question of what about these time-deferred transmissions. Aereo was transmitting more or less in real time. Cablevision was, in saying that they were emulating video, home video recording, they were uh, copying the programming, storing it for later viewing, not for simultaneous viewing. So is that a public performance as well? The Supreme Court said that was not the case before it. It does not, uh, didn't have to decide it. it was, I think that is good legal method. Don't decide a case that's not before you. But it does raise the question, what is the status of a service like Cablevision? <laughs> Here in Europe, uh, services like that, such as WISGO in France, Shift TV in, uh, in Germany, as well as some decisions, uh, the Maneki TV case in Japan, the Optus TV Now case in Australia, uh, most qu courts uh, in other countries, with the exception of Singapore, uh, have held that these sorts of uh, de time deferred storage and individualized communication is a making available to the public. But in the United States, we don't know. So to uh, close the formal part of this presentation, I would say that the United States is largely in compliance with the making, its obligation to implement the making available right, but we have ambiguity on the uh, distribution right side, and we have ambiguity on the public performance side. I, I think the, the law is capable of being interpreted in a way that is consistent with the U.S.'s international obligations, but it has not yet been fully <laughs> interpreted in a way that is consistent with the U.S. international obligations. Thank you. Mrs. Ginsburg. <clears throat> yes. Uh, can you tell us what is the situation right now with Aero? With Aero? With Aero, yes. Uh, as a business, is yes. it going on? Is it pursuing the, <laughs> the objective? Aero has gone bankrupt. So it, does no, it no longer exists. Um, so that's, that's the short answer. I, I, there seems to be a certain amount of echo here. Um, be, because while it was unclear whether the, a service which would have uh, offered the programming uh, as time deferred delivery rather than simultaneous retransmission. Uh, Aereo could possibly have continued to offer that service, but its business model was really built on simultaneous retransmission. So I guess it concluded that it did not have uh, sufficient subscribers for the time deferred service, and so um, it shut down. There are other services uh, that exist, but they're licensed. Right? Uh, what what Aereo was doing was was not licensed. So uh, it is possible to obtain. Uh, digital retransmissions of television programming, but with authorization. Okay, another question. What happens when a um, service uh, that uh, put your content in the, in the cloud, in fact, is serving you with a copy which is not your exact copy? Right. Well, that's what I meant by those hybrid services. So uh, iTunes, Amazon Lots, uh, th there are a lot of, uh, let's say, hybrid retail and um, communication services. So you, you, you buy um, a, a, a CD from iTunes or Amazon, only you never actually possess a physical CD. 
what you're getting is a download to your device, but they will also store it in the cloud so that rather than having to take a device uh, with you, you can uh, take another device like your, your cell phone probably doesn't have that much storage capacity. But if your cell phone can connect to your cloud storage of all those CDs, uh, then that's, that's a nice service. Uh, now, as a practical matter, it's unlikely that those services are going to uh, result in a uh, judicial decision because the services cannot make the initial delivery of the content without authorization, right? They're sending you a copy. That is the reproduction and distribution right. So they're gonna to get to get a license for that. So when they get the license for the reproduction and distribution, they will also get a license for the cloud access. That's what's happening now. Um, and this is also true <coughs> under the, um, we have a compulsory license for making uh, sound recordings for making phonograms of musical compositions and the statutory license scheme now includes what's called a hybrid license for these services who both uh, make and deliver the phono records but now also will stream you the the content so to, to some extent this uh, this is being worked out by by licensing anyway but uh, the the problem arises in those instances where the initial delivery of the content is not licensed. That doesn't mean it's illegal. There might be legal copies, but then the question is whether the subsequent uh, streaming of that content also requires a license. So we, that we don't really know. Jane, I have a question um, with regard to this Benson case that you mentioned, and I know that you know very well. Um, um, well, you know that this Benson case, for the first time, uh, recognizes the fact that uh, link, links can be considered as a linking can be considered as an act of um, making available to the public works, but at the same time, this Benson case um, introduces a very disturbing concept of new public. Uh, so my, my question is uh, whether the aerial case will have been uh, different, the result or the reasoning of the Supreme Court, if they have applied the, the reasoning of the European Court of Justice with regard to the new public. That, I mean, is this, since the aerial subscribers uh, were already people who were watching this broadcasting uh, um, retransmissions could could be uh, interpreted as that they, they were the same public, therefore, uh, well, there, it won't be a, a, an act of communication to the public. I don't know if it is a very complicated yeah. okay. <laughs> reasoning. Well, but. Um, a, as uh, troublesome as the United States copyright uh, law uh, and as complicated as the US copyright law is, we don't yet have the new public uh, uh, um, gloss, right? The, 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 the new public criterion uh, in the EU is uh, quite possibly a um, misapplication of the international norms on communication to the public. The, um, the ECJ first announced this concept of a new public in a case involving the sky and uh, the provision of televisions in hotels, uh, a case I assume all of you know better than, than I know. Uh, but in the course of, uh, of justifying why those retransmissions came within the right of communication to the public, the, the court said that the hotel guests were a new public. Now, in the original incarnation of new public, uh, it was not a condition. Uh, it was simply maybe thrown in as an additional explanation. 
But over time, in the Del Corso and, and other cases, new public suddenly turned into a requirement that in the case of retransmissions uh, the, from an initial authorized transmission, uh, there is uh, the retransmission is uh, a, not a communication to the public if it is not made to a new public. And then the court got itself tied up in knots in the TV catch-up case. Because in TV catch-up, the service uh, which offered to digitize television signals was very careful to make sure that it was not making the signals available to any member of the public who wasn't already entitled to receive that programming by virtue of having paid for a television license in the UK. Just like in Aereo, it was free to air broadcasting. So Aereo subscribers were in a sense entitled to receive that programming. But uh, the, in the TV catch-up case, when the service said there's no new public, because the only people who can get this content are people who are already entitled to receive the content. Then the ECJ created an exception. And the ECJ says, well, the new public condition does not attach if the communication is being made by a different technological means. And since the original communication was over the air, but the retransmission is over the internet, that is a different technological means, so uh, there is a communication to the public. Uh, this is only making things worse, because uh, any time you start to make the copyright law technology de dependent, which in effect the different technological means requirement is doing, uh, I think you are just inviting failure and uh, undue com complication. So in, in Svensson, uh, the, the court says there's not a communication to the public because now it's the same technological means, the, the technological means being, quote, the internet, which itself might be a little bit broad. So it's not that the result in Svensson is wrong. I think this, the result was inevitable. There is no way that the uh, ECJ was going to hold that hyperlinking um, is, requires the authorization of the um, author or copyright owner. Uh, the way they got there, however, is uh, troublesome. In the US, we don't have uh, a um, uh, a new public requirement, we have uh, no um, upper level judicial decision on whether hyperlinking uh, is a form of uh, public performance or uh, distribution of a copy. We have one lower court decision which uh, considers that the provider of a hyperlink is, uh, is, is not contributorily liable for furthering a communication which at the source may have been illegal. But we don't have that much case law on that, so it's, 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 uh, it's, it's unclear. I, I think the, the challenge is to figure out a, um, a, a legally coherent way of getting to the result in, in Svensson that doesn't uh, misinterpret the treaties. Rafael. Gracias. Bueno, gracias. Lo primero a la profesora Gisburg por su, por su explicación y por sus explicaciones. Eh, le quería preguntar eh, hasta qué punto el, el, el legislador americano eh, es eh, consciente de este desfase que se puede estar produciendo con respecto al, a la adaptación, digamos, del Tratado de 1996, el Tratado de, de Derecho de Autor, con respecto a la cláusula del derecho de puesta a disposición. ¿no? Esa, esa bifurcación que obliga a trasladarlo o al derecho de distribución en parte, al derecho de eh, comunicación pública, digamos, por otro lado, ¿no? pero que vemos que está dando resultados prácticos insatisfactorios porque 
da lugar a un cierto decalaje con respecto a, a lo que sería una... Se ha planteado en algún momento hacer un cambio legal, legislativo, y por tanto un reflejo más fiel o más literal de lo que sería el derecho de puesta a disposición proveniente de los tratados de WIPO, o, o no, hay, hay, no, no existe ningún movimiento que nos haga pensar que puede haber una reforma, una reforma legal ¿no? en ese punto. The, uh, I'm not sure that it is actually necessary that it is necessary to uh, have legislative intervention to resolve the gap uh, in the United States compliance. The government took the position in 1996 that it was not necessary for Congress to make any changes to the law because uh, the law as it stood was capable of covering uh, all of the making available right. I think the law remains capable of covering the making available right, that we, uh, that the gaps can be filled by judges. Now, would it be better uh, to have Congress intervene rather than waiting for judges to get it right? Uh, I personally am, very apprehensive of uh, legislative re reform. Uh, there's lots of discussion about legislative reform in the, in the United States that it might be time to have uh, a new Copyright Act. I think that that's very problematic because copyright now, even more so than in 1976, is extremely politically charged with uh, lots of very strong lobbying interests. And what happens, at least in the United States, uh, when you have a, a lot of uh, opposed lobbies is that you start with a law which might be relatively simple but then every lobby wants its little exception or its little provision, and so uh, you get this, right? This, uh, this is, uh, most of this book is the text of the United States Copyright Act, which goes on for hundreds of, of pages and is unduly complex. If Congress could uh, discipline itself to keep things simple, sure, legislative reform would be great. I think that that is very unlikely. And so as problematic as things may be now, my own view is that they are likely only to get worse if we have further legislative uh, in intervention. Desde el punto de vista, eh, la planteo en español, desde el punto de vista de las, de las entidades de radiodifusión cuyas emisiones son eh, retransmitidas por aéreo, eh, ¿qué derechos tentan? ¿Es un derecho exclusivo? ¿Se licenciaría por una licencia obligatoria? Eh, como, o sea, ¿Se podría asimilar al cable y al satélite? ¿O en la práctica, o sea, quiere decir, qué derecho podría ejercer eh, las entidades de radiodifusión primarias, originarias? Eh, frente a Aereo, eh, según el la Copyright Act. Well, Aereo tried to argue that uh, it was a cable service, and therefore should be entitled to a compulsory license, only uh, they did not meet the very detailed statutory requirements for what is a cable service. So uh, they were then... Uh, Before they went bankrupt, they were lobbying the Federal Communications Commission to try to revise the definition of a cable service so that they could get the benefit of the compulsory license, but it didn't happen. The, the cable services uh, really uh, did not like area. Um, in a sense, the cable, the cable services created this problem because Cablevision, the decision which laid the groundwork for Aereo, that concerned a service 
that was offered by a cable company. Uh, the initial three transmissions of the cable company were provided under license, either a compulsory license or a negotiated license. So when the cable company sent out the transmission, that was that was covered by license. But when they then split the transmission so that some of the uh, the works were also not only being sent out in real time, but then were going to these individualized storage boxes. They said, we don't have to get a license for that because that service does not involve a communication to the public or does not involve a public performance um, because it's individualized transmissions. And, and so they, they created this monster and uh, then they became its victims because when Aereo offered a service that would allow people to get television uh, programming uh, um, on their devices. What that meant was that the uh, Aereo subscribers didn't have to have a cable uh, subscription anymore. If Aereo subscribers, if all they wanted was broadcast television with a decent quality signal, right, they didn't want all the extra channels. Right? Uh, they could then they could pay in instead of a hundred dollars a month for the cable service, they could pay ten dollars for Aereo. So Aereo was in very serious competition with the cable companies. So it was somewhat ironic that in the in, when the case got before the Supreme Court, the cable services were on the side of the television broadcasters, even though if they hadn't won the first case, there wouldn't have been an area to compete with cable. Manuel? Thank you, Jane. Well, Aereo shows that the issue becomes more and more complex. And uh, I, I'd like to bring, if there are not more questions let's say, on, on Aereo itself, uh, I'd like to bring a question which is more sensitive. And uh, we have the pleasure to have James Ginsburg with us today, probably the person who understands better how the issues move in the United States and in Europe. And it looks like in the United States, it's a wait and see and see how the courts react. And while in Europe, it is a mess. It is a mess because probably in 2000, 2001, when the, when the Copyright and Information Society, uh, we and I was one of the people there moving the European Commission in those days, but we reacted because the United States had reacted before quite quite earlier before, but we had to react to the, to the new challenges. And uh, we came at the end with a consensus, getting the qualified majority just by chance, I have to say, and uh, without taking into account that many of the solutions were not consistent and probably they were going to be developed in the future in a different way, and this is what happened. Uh, then this was implemented in the different member states in different ways, uh, some some 14 years later, we find, let's say, myriads of cases before the Court of Justice, many of them already settled, many of them don't settle. And we have public opinion completely divided. And uh, w what is your view about what's going to happen in the future? Because we have uh, here a lot of uh, students which are going to devote their life probably to, to, to copyright or, or to intellectual property. They have to defend that's my understanding, because it's also their professional activities, that, that, informa that intellectual property is good for the society, but we have to be probably the most critical ones when addressing the matter. How things are going to move in the next four or five years uh, in the United States and in Europe? Do you understand it? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm, I'm capable of, of predicting the future, but I think I might say something about the mess in, in Europe. And I, I think that a 
tremendous difference between the United States and Europe is, does not concern particular copyright rules that the United States has fair use and Europe has a whole bunch of optional exceptions. Uh, I think the fundamental difference is that uh, in the United States, copyright and patents, uh, but copyright was a uniform federal law from the start. So even when we were only 13 states, the, um, the framers of the Constitution understood that intellectual property uh, is so uh, in inherently pervasive that it would be a mess if we had 13 separate copyright laws. So from the start, we provided for a uniform federal system of copyright. Uh, and in, in Europe so far, uh, the, uh, you don't have a regulation, so you don't have a u uniform uh, copyright law for the European Union. You have directives, but the directives can be implemented, transposed by the 28 member states uh, differently. Um, and moreover, the directives do not cover everything. There are um, many significant areas, such as moral rights, such as ownership, which the directives don't address at all. So there are some aspects of copyright that are purely national law. There are other aspects of the copy of copyright which are harmonized, but they're not so harmonious. And that, I think, is why, as you said, the the European Court of Justice had become extraordinarily active uh, in creating so-called autonomous concepts in order to give uh, uniform uh, pan-European uh, definitions or in interpretations. So um, in, in effect, kind of creating slowly uh, a Euro uniform European uh, copyright law, but it is one that has many, many gaps. So it gives rise to tremendous complexity. So for you, you, all of your, your, your students out there, complexity is bad for society, but good for lawyers. It's, uh, <laughs> Do you want to say anything in closing? No, that's okay. I think you've covered it all. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, on that uh, pro-lawyer note, I guess, <laughs> we, uh, thank you very much for, for, for coming, so, so many of you. This, is, this has been great. Uh, and uh, I, I hope there will, in the future, I can't predict the future of copyright, but I hope the future of the Instituto Autor uh, will include another um, uh, uh, session with me. Thank you. Mm -hmm.